I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself. I'm, oh, I'm on the guy on the end of the table, but, but I'm not even on the brochure. Uh, my name is John Dunn. I'm an emergency physician from uh, Texas, and I work as a civilian contractor teaching emergency medicine at Fort Hood. But I'm a policy advisor. Uh, I'm a lawyer, but I don't practice law. Um, and so I got into all, all kinds of other areas of inquiry and interest, and I taught environmental law about 20 years ago. So I got interested in that area of science and, and what you might say, policy making. So that's the reason why I'm sitting at the end of the table being the moderator for this great group of guys. Um, our, next, uh, our next speaker, this is, this is the great irony of America, okay? Here's a guy who is, uh, uh, he's certainly on the other side. Uh, William Gray would assert uh, that, that he is definitely on the other side of the issue of whether carbon dioxide is a serious problem for us going forward. But he just told me today, well, they didn't have my bio complete, and I am the Montford Professor of Atmospheric Science at Colorado State. Montford is a beef company. They have great big cattle yards. So I think that even though Dr. Denning is a carbon hunter, that he has to say, well, I hunt carbon, but I'm not hunting for methane. <laughs> In any event, he is the former chair of the, uh, former the editor of the C Journal of Climate. He's the chair of the North American Carbon Program. Uh, he is obviously a, a, a distinguished professor at Colorado State, which are a wonderful school, and they keep whipping the Colorado buffaloes every year, and it, it just gives me great, great pleasure as an ex-Nebraska guy to know that. Dr. Denning. If I could, um, Scott and I are in the same department. We're friends. We know each other. And it took a lot of guts for him to come down in this and give the opposite point of view. I want to realize most of the people invited to give the opposite point of view wouldn't come, but Scott did. And thank you very much, Dr. Denny. Not only are you a distinguished scientist, but you're a handsome man. Oh, oh. gee, thanks. <laughs> So um, thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me, and I really do appreciate this opportunity to be here. Um, I've, in the last year, uh, done two uh, debates side by side uh, at a podium uh, with James Taylor of the Heartland Institute, and uh, was, was very impressed with him and with your institute. Um, have been most impressed with your hospitality and the organization of the conference. Uh, very much appreciate that. Professor Gray was one of my professors when I was in graduate school. I've known him for uh, well over 20 years. He's also my neighbor, and I have deep respect for him. I, I learned a lot from, uh, from Bill Gray, and it's a, a, an honor to share the, the, well, the uh, podium with him. I wasn't very persuasive, was I? <laughs> uh, on the other hand, um, as, as friendly as I understand my, this uh, sort of Midwestern uh, audience to be, I was a little worried when I found this in my... Uh, in, in my packet. I, I'm not entirely sure what this is for, but uh, I think I'll keep it around just in case, you know. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to uh, I'm gonna try to debunk what I think are some commonly held myths uh, promulgated in the, in the popular media about global warming. And uh, I see stuff in the media all the time, just like you do in the newspaper, on TV, uh, on the internet, uh, it's, it's remarkable how much this issue is misunderstood and miscommunicated to the American public. I've been very, very disappointed with the way that the popular media and particularly the sort of celebrity media have, uh, have treated this issue. I think it's, it's quite unfortunate and it's a disservice to our great country. So I would say about uh, climate change myths in the media, be skeptical. I'm a skeptic. I would like you to be skeptical too. Treat what you hear with skepticism. Try to compare what the claims that you hear against the facts and against common sense. Uh, one of the myths that you commonly hear, uh, almost everybody seems to think this, is that concern about global warming is based on recent temperature trends. So for example, you may have hear, heard nine of the 10 hottest years on record, yada, yada, yada. You, you get the impression that if somebody could come up with some other cause for the recent warming, we could quit worrying. 
you'd almost think if you listen to the celebrities on TV that the reason people are concerned about global warming is because it's been getting warm recently. But that's not the case. You also tend to hear, uh, if you believe the celebrity media, that global warming is a theory based on some kind of complicated computer models. <laughs> but the real reason is, has to do with the basic physics of heat. If you believe in the conservation of energy, in the idea that adding energy to a system changes its temperature, in the first law of thermodynamics, you don't need any kind of fancy computer models, you don't need thermohaline, salt, El Nino, cloud, CB, up, down, whatever. It's basically the conservation of energy. Finally, another myth that you hear is that CO2 is some kind of air pollutant. Well, CO2 is actually a natural part of the Earth system. It's breathed by plants. Plants take CO2 in in photosynthesis, they release it in, in decomposition and respiration. And so this, this uh, air pollution idea that's been promulgated by the celebrity media gives you the idea that cutting emissions of CO2 will, will actually lead to falling CO2 levels and therefore cooling. This is a, a fallacy based on the idea of air pollution, which dissipates and is reacted away. CO2 is not a reactive gas. It's not like smog, okay? If you stop emitting it, it doesn't just go away. It's a, it's a part of the Earth's system. Finally, you see this almost, almost accepted unilaterally. If we stop burning coal, we're just gonna freeze in the dark. The people that promulgate that myth have no respect for capitalism and free markets. Global warming is based on common sense. It's not based on computer models, it's not based on recent temperatures, and it's not complicated. Let's consider the energy balance of the planet. The Earth is a planet floating in a vacuum, orbiting the sun. 100% of the energy coming into the Earth has to arrive by electromagnetic radiation. It's a vacuum out there. There's no energy coming in and out except by the sunshine warming our planet, and of course, that would just warm the planet without bound if it weren't for the fact that the planet also radiates infrared radiation back to space. The energy comes in as shortwave visible radiation. The energy goes out in invisible longwave uh, thermal infrared radiation. So the basic energy balance of the planet is that whatever energy comes in has to be matched over the long term by energy going out. Now we can quantify this relationship, and I apologize, the next few slides will be a little bit of math, but it's easy math and I'll walk you through it. The energy in can be written as the sunshine, the brightness of the sun, but we don't get to keep all of that sunshine, we reflect some of it out, we call that albedo. So one minus the albedo is the amount of sunshine that's actually absorbed by the planet Earth, and that's uh, in watts per square meter, the sun is about 1,367 watts per square meter. Now, some of you are old enough to remember 100-watt light bulbs. My students are too young to have seen a 100-watt light bulb. But, uh, you know, 100 watts in a square meter, you can sort of imagine how much energy that is. Now, let's take 13 and a half of those, 1,367 watts in every square meter is the brightness of the sun, the amount of sunshine beaming into the Earth. The Earth's albedo is about 30%, so 70% of that 1,367 watts per square meter is absorbed by the planet. Uh, and that's how many watts per square meter. We have to know how many square meters. The Earth absorbs radiation as a circle, as a disk, because it presents a, a circular cross-section to the incoming <coughs> rays of the sun in space. So we have to multiply by pi r squared. That gives us the area of the disk absorbing that, that sunshine. So this is a total number of watts, if you will, on the left-hand side of this. That's the energy in from the sun, and it must be balanced by the outgoing radiation of long-wave uh, thermal infrared radiation to space which is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature of the Earth by the Stefan Boltzmann relationship. Temperature to the fourth, that's temperature times temperature times temperature times temperature, very, very sensitive to temperature. Of course, the Earth doesn't emit temperature as a disk, it emits as a sphere. That is, the emission of long-wave radiation comes from all sides of the Earth, uh, the night and the day side. The surface area of a sphere, as you know, is four pi r squared. So we have an emission out of more square meters than we have an absorption. And you can see that there's some algebra here. You can cancel out the pi r squareds and so forth, uh, bring this uh, constant sigma to the other side, and solve this thing for temperature very easily. And uh, with a little bit of algebra, you obtain that the temperature of the Earth is minus 18 degrees Celsius. Minus 18 degrees Celsius is just about zero degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature of the Earth 
according to this energy balance, simple energy balance, has to be and is zero degrees Fahrenheit. Now that's odd. If the surface temperature of the Earth were zero degrees Fahrenheit, the oceans would be frozen. The oceans would be frozen. If the oceans remained at zero degrees Fahrenheit over geologic time, the oceans would be frozen all the way to the bottom. Our planet would be a white snowball floating in space, reflecting very much most, uh, nearly all of the sunlight that came in, and we wouldn't be here talking about it. This would be an uninhabitable planet if this were the only thing going on. In fact, of course we know the true surface temperature of the Earth is much warmer, about 60 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the radiative equilibrium temperature of the Earth, actually about 15 degrees Celsius uh, instead of the minus 18 degrees. So what's going on here? Something else. We, we do believe in the conservation of energy. We do believe that all the exchange of energy between the Earth and outer space is through electromagnetic radiation in the uh, visible part of the spectrum and in the infrared part of the spectrum. So we're obviously missing something with this model. And it, as it turns out, the true radiative temperature of the Earth really is minus 18 degrees Celsius. It's now been measured from space quite, quite accurately. The surface temperature is nearly 33 degrees Celsius warmer than the radiative temperature because of the absorption of long wave radiation by radiatively active gases in the Earth's atmosphere, namely CO2 and water vapor. Less than 1% of the molecules in the atmosphere account for a nearly 60 degrees Fahrenheit difference in temperature between the radiative uh, equilibrium temperature of the atmospheric envelope around us and the surface underneath. Let's talk a little bit about those molecules and how they work. 99% of the molecules in our atmosphere are made of nitrogen and oxygen, these two diatomic molecules. Um, we're all familiar with oxygen. If you don't believe me about oxygen, try holding your breath for a few minutes. You'll, you'll figure it out pretty quick. Uh, nitrogen is, a, is essentially filler. It's not uh, chemically active in our atmosphere. It doesn't react with much of anything and therefore it accumulated in the atmosphere over geologic time. Uh, these diatomic molecules contain atoms of the same element uh, bonded with uh, shared electrons between them. Think of them like tennis balls on a stick. As these molecules float around, they're the same on either end because they're diatomic molecules. And long wave energy photons can uh, propagate up from the surface of the Earth, interact with those shared electrons, and start them vibrating. Kind of like uh, wah, 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 wah. And that energy of the uh, outgoing radiation is then stored in the vibration of those shared electrons in the, in the diatomic molecules, which can then de-excite by emitting a, a photon of radiation. Think of them as uh, balls on a stick going wah, 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 and going back to their ground state, releasing that energy. So energy can be trapped, stored, and re-emitted by these molecules. But because they're diatomic molecules and identical on either end and only have this one uh, linear bond between them, they're kind of boring to long wave radiation. There are very few quanta, very few energy levels of photon that can interact with these 99% of the molecules in our atmosphere. CO2 and water vapor are different. There are less than 1% of the molecules in our atmosphere, but they account for nearly all of the atmospheric greenhouse effect that keeps our planet habitable. CO2 has three atoms. Uh, let's see, I only have two hands, so this can be the carbon. Here's an oxygen and an oxygen. Just like the nitrogen and, and uh, oxygen, uh, the CO2 molecule can, can vibrate. Whoa, 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 whoa. But hey, there's more. CO2, being a triatomic molecule, has other modes of vibration. For example, or you can sort of imagine all these different geometries of, of uh, molecular vibration, each of which absorb a different wavelength of energy, a different energy level of photon. Therefore, CO2 has a much broader spectrum of absorption in the thermal infrared part of the spectrum than oxygen or nitrogen. Though it's a small fraction of the gas molecules in our atmosphere, accounts for a very large fraction of the absorption. Water vapor is even better. Water vapor is also triatomic, but it has an angle, a bond angle, and it's polar. It's got a plus end and a minus end. So in addition to all the vibrational uh, modes of uh, interaction that CO2 has, it's got this kind of mode, and it's got this kind of mode, and all sorts of stuff. It can even do flips. I, I'm not going to try that here. That might be kind of dangerous. Um, the absorption spectrum of CO2 and water vapor were first measured by John Tyndall 
uh, a famous British uh, thermodynamicist and physicist in 1863 and published in that year, before the US Civil War. So I'm not telling you anything new here. This, this science wasn't invented by Al Gore. Uh, it was invented before the US Civil War. This is, is 19th century science, very, very well established science. So I pose to you some common sense. Doubling CO2 would add four watts to every square meter of the planet, of the surface of the Earth, 24-7. Now, I don't know if you remember these little light bulbs. Uh, these are like, you know, kids' night lights. Back in the day, we used to use these for Christmas tree lights. They're four-watt light bulbs. Picture, if you will, our planet covered with one of these light bulbs in every square meter of the planet that never turns off, 24-7, four watts per square meter of energy. Now, most of us think that that would make the surface warmer. Adding one of these light bulbs running 24-7, 365 days a year would warm the surface of the Earth. This was actually known before light bulbs were invented. This is a very old result. It was first discovered by Tyndall in the 1860s and first published with estimates of the amount of surface warming for a doubling of CO2 by Arrhenius in 1897. So when you think about global warming science, think 1863. Don't think 2010. So I, this brings me to common misconception number one. Expectations of future warming are based on extrapolation of recent warming trends. Have you ever heard that? You see pictures like this that show the temperature change, temperatures in the uh, 19th century kind of flat, then rising some more in the early part of the 20th century, flattening out and then rising again since about the 70s. And you might think by all the celebrity press coverage that this is the reason people expect global warming. Not true. The reason we expect global warming has nothing to do with past temperatures. Rather, we expect global warming because we believe that when you add energy to something, it changes its temperature. If I add four watts per square meter to every square meter of the surface of the Earth, 24-7, 365 days a year for the next thousand years, I expect that's going to change the temperature. I say be a climate skeptic. It's true, as Professor Gray has indicated in the last lecture, maybe something's gonna happen to the Earth system that somehow cancels out this extra four watts of heat in every square meter of the planet. Why, the sun could dim four watts per square meter. Giant clouds of interplanetary dust might come and block the sun. Fog could somehow shroud the surface of the Earth, reflecting sunlight to space. These things would be fortuitous and would be nice if they happened, and maybe they will. Professor Gray has outlined a mechanism. Actually, I have to credit him. He's one of the only people I've ever heard actually pose a mechanism by which we could get rid of that four watts per square meter. Professor Gray hypothesizes that increased up moist down dry circulations in the atmosphere of the Earth caused by increased tropospheric cooling due to radiative interactions with CO2, that extra up moist down dry circulation will actually cool the earth. This is his hypothesis and it's testable. One can go out and take measurements and test whether in fact increased subsidence due to increased cumulonimbus clouds is offsetting four watts per square meter of, of uh, increased radiation. Media celebrities seem certain that something like this will happen, but I say be skeptical. Be a climate skeptic. Don't believe everything you've heard. In 1897, Svant Arrhenius explained the situation this way. Take the Earth and the sun. As we've already seen, sunshine warms the Earth. Some of that sunshine is reflected back to space uh, times the albedo. But the atmosphere blocks some of that outgoing, uh, the outgoing long wave radiation. Given the surface temperature of the Earth, and some radiation going out uh, that's proportional to the fourth power, in this case of surface temperature, we introduce uh, a new relationship here with an epsilon in it, which is the effective emissivity of the Earth's, Earth's, uh, of the planet. You can, again, rearrange this algebraically and obtain uh, through some very simple algebra a simple relationship right here give, to give the change in surface temperature of the Earth for a fractional change in the effective emissivity of the Earth's atmosphere. This is really simple. This is well over 100 years old, this result. This was not obtained from models. This was not obtained from computers. This result was obtained before Edison invented the light bulb.
But now we have values that we can plug into this Arrhenius relationship. So for example, we know that 240 watts per square meter is the true value for this epsilon sigma ts to the fourth, and that's from satellite data. Furthermore, we know that doubling CO2 will give us four watts per square meter of extra downward long wave radiation. We know this from modern spectroscopy and radiative transfer calculations. We can therefore plug these two numbers into this relationship and calculate uh, that about 1.2 degrees Celsius of warming would arise from doubling CO2 alone, almost exactly what Professor Gray said in the last talk. And so with no feedback whatsoever, we expect about two degrees Fahrenheit of warming for doubled CO2. This is exactly what uh, Professor Gray just said. And as he also said, there's some feedback to be considered. If we change the emissivity of the planet, we expect a change in surface temperature, but, but there's more because a change in surface temperature will, will have some amplifying factors. For example, we might imagine that you change the water vapor or change the albedo of the planet. As you melt snow, you make the planet darker. It absorbs more sunshine. Uh, if you increase the amount of high clouds, as Professor Gray mentioned, you can wind up having extra downward long wave radiation from those. Uh, on the other hand, there are negative feedbacks. For example, as you warm the surface, you have extra long wave cooling from the surface, which will tend to cool the planet and reduce the amount of warming. Or you could make extra low clouds, which would tend to reflect more sunlight to space. When we take that Arrhenius calculation from 1897, we have to update it with an understanding of climate feedbacks given the current uh, much, much better observational constraints we have on the climate system in the 21st century compared to Arrhenius and Tyndall in the 19th century. And now we can learn from the past because unlike Tyndall or Arrhenius, we have a much better understanding of the long climate history of the Earth. 18,000 years ago, uh, almost a third of the land surface of the Earth was covered with snow and ice. Uh, there, was, there was glacial ice all the way to New York City, calving giant icebergs into what uh, would later become uh, you know, Long Island Sound. Long Island is actually a glacial moraine from that period. And we can use this past climate change to understand and, and reveal the sensitivity of the climate, the overall sum of all those climate feedbacks that, that interact with the, the uh, long wave radiation feedback. We know, for example, from removing cores from the uh, Antarctic ice sheet, that CO2 over the last several glacial cycles has varied between about 180 parts per million during the ice ages. Uh, each of these, these down periods is, is an ice age and about uh, 280 parts per million in between ice ages, what we call the interglacial period. And uh, it's remarkable how the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere beats like a clock with the heartbeat of the ice ages. During interglacial periods, CO2 is released from the oceans, driving the CO2 up to about 280 parts per million. During ice ages, uh, the oceans absorb about one third of all the CO2 molecules in the atmosphere, pull CO2 back down to about 180 parts per million uh, by volume. And we can use that data to estimate the total climate sensitivity given the ice ages. At the last glacial maximum, about 18,000 years ago, the surface temperature of the Earth is observed to have been about six degrees Celsius colder than it is today. The CO2 was about 180 ppm at that time, for giving us a weaker greenhouse effect, less absorption of uh, long wave radiation about 4.1 watts per square meter more long wave radiation uh, going out to space during the last ice age than we have today. At the same time, the surface was much brighter than it is today uh, with enormous glaciers covering about a third of the planet, uh, reflecting much of the sun to space, accounting for about 3.4 watts per square meter additional solar radiation reflected to space. So we have a total of a six degrees of cooling for about uh, 7.5 degrees, uh, excuse me, 7.5 watts per square meter less total radiation, given a total climate sensitivity of about eight tenths of a degree Celsius per watt per square meter. Uh, and that's integrated over all the feedbacks in the Earth system. This is not from models. This is from observations of the real climate system as it's behaved over the last 18,000 years as revealed by geology. We don't use any models to obtain this, but if we plug in our modern uh, spectroscopy measurements of about four watts per square meter for a doubling of CO2 and use the climate sensitivity that's revealed by the last ice age, we obtain a warming of about 3.2 degrees Celsius for a doubling of CO2. Not using computer models, 
using 19th century science as updated by modern understanding of paleoclimate data from ice cores and geology. So this is a review of the 19th century understanding, far long, long before Al Gore, IPCC, computer models, before Bill Gray was born, <laughs> before Edison invented the light bulb. Forcing is the change in the property of the atmosphere as measured by spectroscopy. The finest spectroscopy of the 21st century confirms what's been known since 1863, four watts per square meter per doubling of CO2. The feedback, both positive and negative feedbacks, add together to give a total response to that forcing estimated from ice age climate data of eight tenths of a degree C per watt per square meter. You do the math, you get a response of about three degrees Celsius of warming for double CO2 without using a comp complicated climate model, just based on observations. Now it ha so happens that modern climate models agree quantitatively very, very closely with this 19th century result. This result has stood the test of time. This result has been around for six or seven generations of science and has yet to be refuted. But you can go to this conference and hear people today who are trying to tell you that all that extra radiation is just going to go away, that energy is not conserved, that something is going to come out of the woodwork and get rid of all those extra jewels. Those who believe in the conservation of energy in the first law of thermodynamics would ask you to be skeptical. The current CO2 concentration is about 388 parts per million by volume in 2009 as measured by a network of well over 100 uh, stations around the world. It's about 30% uh, higher than it was 200 years ago, and it's about 100% higher than it was during the last ice age. Um, by the end of this century, uh, we expect, I should say, it has been proposed that China and India ramp up their economies based on coal, and that the uh, number of people living a modern 21st century lifestyle goes from about a billion people today to about three billion people by the middle of the century. If you expect China and India to follow the path that the West has taken and to ramp up their economies based on coal, you can expect not a 30% increase in CO2, but about a 300% increase in CO2 by the end of the century. Common misconception number two, when we reduce or stop burning fossil fuel, the CO2 will go away and things will go back to normal. Actually, it's not true. CO2 has to be removed from the atmosphere by, by reaction, chemical reaction with the oceans, and the oceans are very slow to mix, as Professor Gray has explained in the last talk. So what? Let's look again at some paleoclimate data. These plots show sea level in, uh, in meters relative to today. Uh, in the Pliocene, about three million years ago, uh, the temperature today is about 15 degrees Celsius. In the Pliocene, it was about 17 degrees, and the sea level was about 25 meters higher than it is today. In the Eocene, it was about 20 degrees, or 19 degrees Celsius. The sea level was about 70, 70 meters higher than today. In the last glacial maximum, 20,000 years ago, it was about 10 degrees Celsius, and the sea level was about 120 meters below where it is today. The IPCC has forecasted by the end of the century, the climate will warm this much, but the sea level won't go up. Is that credible? Do you think that the IPCC might be missing something here? Do you think that climate models might have forgotten about the fact that we know from the long history of the Earth about a relationship between sea level and temperature? The reason the IPCC forecasts little sea level rise is because ice melting is very slow. It's on geologic time. It takes a long time. Eventually, a three degrees Celsius warming will produce a lot of sea level rise. If the future looks like the past, if the future behaves as we know that the past has behaved over and over again over millions of years, we expect tens of meters of sea level rise for a three degrees Celsius of warming. I want to talk briefly with a take off my scientist hat, as the last uh, speaker said, and talk as an educated layperson. Imagine it's 1800 and you're in charge. Bill, you can be the, the king of the world. Bill Gray, king of the world. 
Somebody presents you with a grand idea for transforming the world economy. He says, here, let's dig 8 billion tons of carbon out of the ground every year. We'll build a system of pipelines, super tankers, railroads, highways, and trucks to deliver that carbon to every street corner on the planet. Oh, there's more. We're going to build millions of cars every year and millions of mo miles of road to drive them on. And, and we're going to generate electricity and pipe it to every house in the planet to power lights and stereos and plasma TVs. And I can just see, Bill, you got your accountant starting to tally things up, and she comes along and says, here's your itemized bill. I want you to imagine what the cost would be of, say, 30 grand a car times millions of cars a year. How much does it cost to build a mile of highway? How much does it cost to build a super tanker? How much does it cost to dig up a billion tons of coal? That's how much money it costs to build the system we have, and we didn't go broke building that system, let me tell you. That's more money than there was in the world in 1800. Where did the money come from to build the system that we had? Do you think it was raised by taxes? Do you think governments spent all that money to build that system? I don't think so. And now we get to do it again. The worst myth, media myth of all is that without the subsidy of cheap fossil fuel, civilization will crumble. People will freeze in the dark. They'll starve. Oh my God, the sky is falling. Tell me if you've heard this one. Be skeptical. Be very skeptical when you hear this kind of malarkey from the celebrity media. That's pathetic. You'd think those un-American naysayers had never heard of capitalism, of the magic of markets, of the creative genius of a free people. Do you really think entrepreneurs will sit and shiver in a post-fossil world? Do you really have that little confidence in capitalism? Choose your future. Alarmist politicians and pundits will tell you, modern wealth is due only to the subsidy of cheap fossil fuel. If we stop burning coal, we'll freeze in the dark. I prefer to think that modern wealth results from ingenuity and hard work, and that long before we run out of oil, we'll invent energy technologies for the 21st century. The future is bright. Thank you very much. <laughs>